Good afternoon, everybody. Um, last session of the day for Yes Day 2. Um, I would like to welcome you all to today's speaker series. Uh, we're joined by a person who needs almost no introduction, uh, design thought leader and giant Ellen Lupton. Now, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that we're on the land, the land on which George Brown College is situated is a traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation and other Indigenous peoples that have lived on this land. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community and on this territory. Across the School of Design, we remain committed to identifying and removing systemic barriers to accessing college programs and services, and we're committed to identifying strategies, tools, and actions to better support our Indigenous student population. Now, in a commitment to build connections and opportunities for students to engage with design's visionaries, YES features a week-long lecture series, 18 to be exact. The design-focused speaker series has been cultivated in an effort to provide dynamic perspectives and unique discussion opportunities for members of our community, including students and faculty alike. Honest advice for designers from really good designers connects the School of Design community with those who have impacted the industry on a local and global scale through lectures and discussions. This is followed by an opportunity for conversation and dialogue using the YouTube chat. Please feel free to relay all of your questions for Ellen there. With that, I would like to introduce Ellen Lupton, who is a writer, curator, educator, and designer. Lupton is the Betty Cook and William O. Steinsman Design Chair at MICA, the Maryland Institute of College of Art in Baltimore. She serves as a senior curator at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York City. Ellen Lupton is a senior curator of contemporary design at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York City. Her exhibitions include the Hubert Bayer Bauhaus Master, Face Values, Understanding Artificial Intelligence, How Posters Work and the Senses, Design Beyond Vision. Lupton is the Betty Cook and William O. Sensman Design Chair at Mika in Baltimore, where she has authored numerous books on design processes, including Thinking with Type, Graphic Design Thinking, and Graphic Design, The New Basics, all staples for us across the School of Design. Her recent books, Design and Storytelling and Health Design Thinking, were published by Cooper Hewitt. She is an AIGA gold medalist and a fellow of the American Academy of Art Science, Arts and Sciences. Moderating the Q&A portion of today's session is graphic design graduate Jasmine Silang. Jasmine will be entering the Honors Bachelor of Brand Design program at the School of Design this summer. She is passionate about designing for social good, typography, and editorial design. Her thesis project surrounds the idea of providing resources to support BIPOC students in the pursuit of a career in the creative industry and to educate the parents of those students on the viability as a designer. Jasmine is an active leader in her school community involving herself with the award-winning typographic exhibition, The Pi Project, and the Yes Year End Show Awards Committee. Personally, I would like to thank Jasmine for all of her work over the last five months on preparing for this week's activities. So welcome and thank you, Jasmine. With that, I am pleased to turn over to Ellen who will begin with her presentation. Thank you so much, Anna and Jasmine and everybody who's here today. I'm, I'm really excited to, to join you. So can you see my screen? We're good? Yeah? Yep, um, you're all good. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about visual storytelling, which is a subject I'm really into. <laughs> and I hope that uh, you'll be able to learn from it and actually get some uh, techniques for how to amplify the role of storytelling in your work and your visual work. And I'm gonna talk about ideas from uh, three of my books and those should all be visible on the screen right now. Um, my book, Design is Storytelling, How Posters Work, and then my latest book, Extra Bold, a feminist, inclusive, anti-racist, non-binary field guide for graphic designers, which comes out next week on, on May 11th. So I'm really excited to, to share these ideas with you. Um, and I'm gonna talk about some of the principles of storytelling that really connect what we do as graphic designers and visual designers to the history of storytelling as a verbal activity. Um, in, in writing and screenplays and telling stories around the campfire. And those techniques from, uh, from more word-based narrative translate really interestingly into visual design. Um, so one of the principles is the idea of point of view. And when we read a story or we go to a movie, 
um, every scene is depicted from the point of view of one or more characters, you know, the main character, the person who we are experiencing the world with empathy on their behalf. And so movie posters are a really fun way to look at how point of view and interior thought can be represented through graphic design. And Cooper Hewitt has many amazing movie posters and I love looking at them and thinking about how the designer tried to interpret that inner life, the mental life of a character through graphic design. So in this poster, we see the title character and his face has been cut um, and pulled apart so that the title of the film is like inside his head. <laughs> and it's such a beautiful, simple montage uh, technique. Um, and it's something that you can uh, try yourself and think about how you could take a very simple image of a person and actually open up their head to interior thought um, and kind of get inside their head. <laughs> so it's a good thought game uh, to play. Um, this is another amazing poster from the Cooper Hewitt collection. And it's a theater poster. And what's depicted in this image is a very uncomfortable family dinner. I hope yours don't go this way. <laughs> um, and we have people sitting around the table. We have um, mom standing on a chair, which is not typical. And chained to the floor um, in front of us is dad. Um, and dad is our point of view character because he is looking right at us. He is making eye contact with us. Uh, whereas everybody else in the scene, <laughs> their psychological identity is closed to us. And the designer has used this very simple kind of universal technique of the circle to shut off the other characters and bring us into this um, state of empathy and identification with dad, who is wearing a leash and is attached to the table. <laughs> and so it makes us curious, how did he get there? And will he get away? Will he find um, freedom? And I love looking at editorial illustration, uh, much of which uses graphic design techniques like uh, photography and juxtaposition of, of shapes um, in order to illustrate these kinds of psychological situations. Um, so what you see on the screen now is a series of illustrations for the New York Times Magazine by Christiana Cusero, who creates these incredible photo-based illustrations. And this series illustrates an article about the age of rudeness. And so she wants us, the reader, to experience what is it like when someone is rude to you, <laughs> right? When do you feel that you're being erased and overlooked and, and blotted out? Um, and these are some other incredible illustrations from this series. Um, and so she's used photography and graphic shapes, right? Very simple graphic shapes and overlapping fields of ink. Um, to create this sense of psychological distress, right? So this giant hand pointing at us and we're tiny and we're looking up, right? Or these big mouths, right? The internet screaming at us and we're small and we're being blotted out. Um, and so really good storytelling conveys emotion and it conveys emotion from a point of view, right? Um, sometimes graphic design actually seeks to avoid emotion. So this is a series of, this is from a poster by the CDC in the US about um, COVID-19 symptoms. Uh, and the designer has decided to erase emotion by not having eyes, right? No eye contact. And to kind of um, 
minimize the discomfort of the subject uh, by taking away that emotional feeling. Not all designers have approached this topic in that, in that way. Um, here's an amazing infographic by Mona Chalabi. Um, and she's decided to actually ramp up the emotional impact of her graphic um, by showing us uh, symptoms in a very <laughs> vivid graphic way, and also giving us um, psychological contact with the characters by giving them faces and eyes. Um, and it, it makes a much more human um, interaction with the image. Um, this is a very famous poster from the Cooper Hewitt collection, Milton Glaser's Bob Dylan poster. Um, and he is representing Dylan as thinking, right? So by uh, eliminating his facial features and instead having this kind of shadow portrait, um, we, we go inside Dylan's head and we hear his music and we think about his lyrics, right? We think about what's going on in his mind. And it's such a, a beautiful and simple graphic technique. Um, and it's something that we can see um, in other illustrations, again, editorial illustrations that try to bring us inside somebody's mind. Um, this is a beautiful uh, magazine cover by one of my students at MICA. <laughs> and I love this little terrarium. And she's made this illustration to represent kind of life during the pandemic and life under isolation, um, but showing that there's so much happening um, in a person's mind, even in that, in that sense of quiet. Um, what else about stories? Every story has a path. Stories take place over time. Stories take us somewhere. Um, in some stories, the path is so important, it's almost a character in the plot, like the famous fairy tale about Hansel and Gretel, or the Wizard of Oz and the Yellow Brick Road, or the Incredible Road in Mad Max Fury Road, right? These paths um, are what the story is all about. Um, and if I look at a very simple image like this of a forest, that road already implies action. It implies a journey that I could take and it expresses a point of view. I'm standing in that road. I'm getting ready to travel down that road. And as designers, we can create images or choose images that invite people to go on a journey. Um, so here's two pictures <laughs> of a forest. And I invite you just to think about which image invites you on a journey, which image feels more narrative. Um, and for me, it's image B because of that invitation to take a journey. Um, and if you Google big pictures of forest, <laughs> you will get the most popular pictures of forest, the most commonly downloaded, chosen, used, linked to images of forest. And most of them have some kind of narrative. They have two big trees talking together or a path or a stream, or a waterfall. Um, they have an invitation to enter the scene. And designers and artists have always known that. Um, it's part of what we do when we compose an image, um, is we invite people to enter. This is a poster by E. McKnight Coffer from Cooper Hewitt's collection. And we have an amazing collection of his work and an exhibition opening of his work in September. I hope you can all come to New York and see it or, or visit us online. And this is a travel poster and Coffer has created a path. 
he's created an invitation for us to enter the scene. Um, this is a later poster by Koffer, and it's more modern, it's more futuristic. But in a way, it has the same composition. It has a path, and that path leads us to the future, and the future is a motorcycle. So even a still image is a journey. Um, here's a beautiful um, drawing, editorial drawing by Christoph Niemann, who's one of my favorite designers and illustrators. And I'm showing you the top of the drawing. And we're gonna travel down the drawing and discover what's really happening in this scene. Oh no, <laughs> the laundry. <laughs> Um, and so that's a path. And when we create an image, we can imagine what order is someone going to read it and what will they discover as they travel through our image. This is another drawing by Christoph Niemann. And I'd like you just to take a moment and guess what is the person knitting? Oh, yes, not socks, <laughs> the Eiffel Tower. Um, another key point about stories is that they have action. Um, and when we create a poster or a book cover or a brand image, we want to convey action. So this is another poster by E. McKnight Coffer. <laughs> and it's about that great feeling you get when you have a cup of tea in the afternoon. And I took a look at this poster and I thought, well, what if I got rid of the action? What happens if I make the poster more passive? And I would do that by getting rid of the angle. Oh no! <laughs> Now it's become static, and I could do this all day, right? Good poster, bad poster, good poster, <laughs> bad poster. Um, and there's the path. We read the poster from top to bottom, uh, but the designer has emphasized that sense of the dynamic by introducing that angle, that element of visual instability that creates that feeling of action. So as designers, um, we can use basic composition uh, to create a feeling of action. <coughs> we can also show action more literally, like this poster by Massimo Vignelli, where he's shown the dancer moving in time, and he's chosen that point of highest intensity the top of the narrative arc to end the story. And he leaves it to us to wonder, will Fred Astaire fly away or will he come down at the end of his leap? And we can create narratives like this one, um, a little cartoon about breakfast in bed that literally take the form of a comic book or a storyboard, a narrative sequence and unfold the elements of the story. And we see this a lot in uh, user experience design, in uh, websites, for example, or instructions, uh, which offer the user uh, the opportunity to download a new product or be onboarded to a new service by breaking down a task into a sequence. Um, um, and that the idea of the rule of threes is something that writers and comedians, as well as experienced designers, often use in their work. And it's the idea that um, readers and users are comfortable with the number three, uh, with one, two, three steps, beginning, middle, end that that's a very uh, accessible rhythm. And when people see three things in a sequence, they expect 
a story. They expect this sense of ease and satisfaction of understanding something. Um, and so I see these everywhere. I collect them. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very common pattern uh, that works because people are familiar with it. This is from my book, uh, just another Amazon delivery. Um, and, and it's really interesting to read some of the psychological research about the rule of threes. This is from an article I read recently that talked about how when you are um, trying to promote a product by claiming how great it is or how many people upvoted it or you know what its what its best characteristics are three is a really good number but when you go to four people start disbelieving you <laughs> and so it's interesting um, to see that pattern and then to see how designers use it so this is on the website for the mint phone service and it's showing us these three great review sites that have endorsed the service, but actually it's seven. And so they've grouped these other ones underneath um, in order to um, show more and yet still give us the impression of, of three, which is more psychologically available to people. Or three different tools offered by this website when actually it's 12. Or this, which is instructions about preparing to visit an emergency room. And it's very overwhelming information. It's not information people want to read. Um, and break it, by breaking it down into three steps, it, it gives some kindness and empathy uh, to the user. Um, the rule of threes is also used by comedians. Um, and so when we have a sequence of three items, uh, sex, violence, pastels, often a comedian will end that last one and make it break the pattern, make it surprise us. Um, and so it's a way to use what people expect, but change it. Um, in order to create an element of surprise. Um, and here the rule of threes is being used, but actually it's the, the middle element that's changed. And again, it's playing with our expectation, our familiarity with this phrase, but making it so much cuter because it's puppies. I want to talk about another really famous pattern in storytelling, which is called the hero's journey. And you may have read about this or heard about it in a literature class or a class about the history of filmmaking, but also relates to design and to creating experiences. Um, so the, the hero's journey is a pattern found in narratives all around the world for thousands of years in which the hero starts at home and starts in a familiar place and then gets a call to adventure. And the, the hero accepts the call, usually after saying no the first time, very important part of the pattern, and then goes out on the adventure and enters a special world a magic place, a place that's foreign, that's different, that has its own rules. Um, and they endure many challenges in this special world. And eventually they exit and are reborn um, and come back to their ordinary place. But they come back changed, right? They come back um, with new strength and new knowledge from their journey, from their hero's journey. Um, and so it could be Ulysses traveling through the Mediterranean on his ship. It could be Dorothy on her yellow brick road, escaping Kansas and seeking the special place of Oz. Or it could be Imperator Furiosa on her journey down Fury Road, 
and ultimately coming home, right? Coming back from the place that she was seeking. So I want you to think about <clears throat> a retail experience. And some of you may have been in an Ikea store. <laughs> and an Ikea store is very much designed to transport you to another place a place where everything is branded, where everything is designed to contribute to this singular, immersive, all-encompassing experience of the store. Um, I've often thought that going to Ikea was like going to a maze. But then I started doing research. And in fact, there is scholarly research about the psychology and design of Ikea stores. And what I learned is that it's not a maze, it's a labyrinth. And these are actually two different kinds of path. A maze is designed to confuse us. And at every juncture, we don't know which way to turn. Is it left or right or going forward? Whereas a labyrinth, is one long path that you stay on. And an Ikea store is actually designed to be that path. And the store is full of maps like this one that tell you which way to go and keep you on that path and continue to expose you <laughs> to all of the scenes in the story. Um, and here we are, like Dorothy, on the yellow brick road, but instead it's a shiny vinyl road. Um, and it tells us very clearly <laughs> where to go. And even if all you want is napkins and a new pot, uh, you travel through these vignettes of the perfect kitchen and the perfect bachelor pad and the perfect uh, children's bedroom. Um, and occasionally there's a secret escape hatch for people who know how to get off the path. Um, and finally, when we get through the store and have passed all the mer merchandise and found all our stuff and filled up our cart, um, we come to the end. And at the end, there is a hot dog. And this hot dog is so cheap they're actually paying you to eat it. And it's fantastic, especially the new vegetarian hot dog. I just wanna to go to Ikea just for dinner. <laughs> and they put that hot dog there at the end as this psychological reward and, and just mercy to you for having survived the hero's journey. And if that hot dog wasn't there, you would die like Jack Nicholson at the end of The Shining, where he gets lost in that maze and freezes to death. This hot dog is life-saving. Um, and so I wanna think about this in relation to graphic design as well, that when we design a book or a website or an exhibition or an interactive information graphic, we are making decisions about what degree of freedom we're offering our user. Um, so if I go to the New York Times website, which is basically a portal to dozens and then hundreds of different things that I could read, the designer has made some choices, right, to make some content catch my eye through scale. But basically, I have a lot of freedom. Um, I have a lot of freedom to choose my own direction. Um, so it's more like a maze um, than a labyrinth. If I go to a site like this, this is the new museum in New York City, um, and it's the exhibition site for their current show, it's really a linear path. I have one big image that fills the entire top of the screen. Um, I scroll downward. Um, I, I am attracted by another image, and if I click on it, you know, I can enter and go inside, and then I can go left or right, 
and view other images in a slideshow that takes over my whole screen um, that is much more of an immersion. Um, and so I want you to think about this as one of our key choices that we make um, when we're designing is are we creating a linear or nonlinear uh, path? Um, and I wanted to, um, to relate this to one of my own projects um, and just show you some of the decisions that myself and my um, illustrator, co-designer made uh, in putting together this book. Um, so this is my book that comes out next week. Um, and it's designed with seven co-authors, which is the most people I've ever worked with and was really fun and very nonlinear, much more of a maze than a labyrinth. Um, and inside the book, there are um, really serious um, articles, um, essays explaining principles like feminism and systemic racism or intersectionality as shown here. Um, and a spread like this is very linear. It's text. It's designed to be read from beginning to end, top to bottom. But it was really important to us in creating this book to also offer nonlinear experiences and to offer experiences where the reader has absolute freedom uh, to explore what they want to explore. Um, so in this chapter on intersectionality, we start with an essay, but then there's a map um, and we take the idea of the intersection and make an actual traffic intersection that the reader can enter at any place and study and think about some of these little scenes and illustrations, right? So imagine being in the Ikea store <laughs> and there's the living room and the, the bedroom and, and the kitchen. And an illustration like this has these little scenes that you can enter and you're free to read one or two or all of them and go in any order to learn more about that topic in this nonlinear and more playful way. Or this is an essay by my co-author Leslie Ja about hiring for diversity. Um, and Leslie contributed this great research about how diversity hiring works and what the role of corporations is versus employees in this process. Um, and it's very hard hitting and, and very intense. And this is a linear essay. <laughs> Um, but we also wanted to create a nonlinear experience, a more gamified experience of the same content. And even though there's a path, this red line, this red arrow that, that travels through the layout, really you can enter it anywhere. Um, and you can find a scene that intrigues you and read that short text about it. And we believe that this way of designing is more accessible it offers experiences for different kinds of readers, uh, for people that enjoy reading long form text. We've got that with footnotes and depth, but we also have these more playful kinds of experiences. And then really the, I think the ultimate kind of storytelling is a comic book <laughs> with characters talking to each other. Um, and I'm going to end just by showing you a couple of these illustrations. Um, this is from a chapter about psychological safety at work and about how different behaviors that people um, use at work uh, can really invite uh, collaboration and confidence from everyone or can actually be hijacking. So in this scene, Maya is presenting a concept at a meeting at work and Bob immediately just talks over her and takes her idea. Um, and so we have this simple kind of uh, dialogue and, and scene here. Um, and then in another scene, um, Maya presents an idea 
And Luis just shuts it down immediately because this is not a good time to be questioning their process. And he's just angry that she even has an idea. Um, so that's defensive behavior. And we can see Bob here, he's in all the scenes. Um, and as the story progresses, he just becomes sleepier and sleepier. So there he is in scene one. And now he's getting really tired. And we like this little Easter egg where by the end of the story, even though the workplace has become a kinder, gentler uh, place, Bob is completely asleep. <laughs> so I'm gonna end it there. Um, and I'd love to talk with Jasmine and, and hear what kind of questions y'all might have about storytelling and how you can use it in your work. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much, Ellen, for that wonderful presentation on storytelling. I think it's it's such an important aspect of design that um, many people don't really utilize enough and don't recognize much in the work that they do. Um, so I want to start the questions off um, with you, you said at the beginning. Of Are your you going to bring me back to the scene because I still can't see you guys, <laughs> or do I just have to escape? Sorry. Yeah, if you just close your window, you'll be able to. Okay, give me a second. All right, there you are. It was kind of cool not having to look at my face the whole time. <laughs> but I'm excited to um, to see Jasmine. Hi, yeah. Jasmine. Hi. Nice to <laughs> um, see nice, you. Yeah, it's nice to, to speak like face to face now. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to go back to kind of the beginning of your presentation when you said you really love storytelling. And mm -hmm. um, I, I want to ask, uh, when did you discover the role and importance of storytelling and design? And what inspired you to create a book <laughs> on this topic? That's a great question. Actually, I took some creative writing classes um, about six or seven years ago, because I do a lot of writing in my work. But my writing isn't creative. My writing is about basically explaining stuff, you know, like how to make a drop cap in InDesign. <laughs> That's not creative. And so I thought, wow, I would love to improve my, um, my writing. And I was taking these classes and realizing that I would never be a novelist and never write a good short story, but that the ideas that were being discussed were so relevant to what we do in design. So like the idea of action, um, it's like design is so much more interesting when it's active and not passive. And writers know that, but designers, maybe we know it, but we haven't made it explicit. Yeah. Um, and so I was really excited. To, I learned about the hero's journey. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, that's like going into a store and feeling like you have and you know, like Dunkin' Donuts, right? Where everything is branded, the, the floor, the wallpaper, the light fixtures, the menu, and of course the food mm -hmm. has all been designed to create a world that we enter and we leave behind the street and we enter Dunkin' Donuts and it's a branded paradise for me. I miss it. I haven't been there for a year. Mm -hmm. It's on my list. <laughs> Um, so I, it was really from studying uh, literature and creative writing that I got interested in building up that connection for designers. Yeah, that's so interesting and in how um, you kind of shifted your um, your stance as a designer uh, into as a storyteller in, in design. And um, you mentioned Dunkin' Donuts and it reminded me of um, <laughs> uh, now with uh, COVID happening, like we have, at least in Canada, we have in some stores like floor stickers where it kind of guides yes. you to stay within a certain distance. You go up to the, the, the here's a line, and then you, you leave with your drink, and it, it all directs you in that way. So that's really That's a path. Yeah, everything's right? Everything is about directing how people move through that physical space. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the year of graphic design on floor. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, I've done some of that work myself, and it's like, oh, this is, this is what direct design is coming to. Um, I wanted to ask, also ask, uh, what is your best advice for designers just learning about storytelling and interested in implementing it more into their design practices? Um, well, I, there's a lot of really good tools. Um, so there's like the idea of planning out the plot and that's like a, a, a journey map 
or a map showing um, where people will have trouble, like in your app, right, where they're going to like trip up or have to wait or get confused. Those are graphic tools um, used in, in design process that are actually borrowed directly from storytelling. Um, so there's that element of like planning out uh, how people will interact with the product. Your example of the floor at Dunkin' Donuts is like planning out where people will go. Like imagine designing airport security oh, yeah. in 2011. Nobody knew how to do it. And during that year, <laughs> you saw airports like completely redesigning for this new journey, right? This new path. But then there's the emotional side. And how do you create that sense of emotional connection for people? And so if you think about any kind of um, story or, you know, like a Netflix series or a novel, there's the mechanics of the plot. And we might think of that as the message that we're trying to convey or the action we want somebody to take, like donate to, you know, India or some kind of action. But then there's also that emotional side of how do you actually engage somebody's interest in taking this action. Um, and so those two things together are really key to what we do as mm -hmm. storytellers. Yeah, and I think um, with the design students listening now, be sure to take notes uh, on this. Uh, I think right now we'll take an audience question. Great. Okay, Sage says, we hear all the time to bring storytelling into pitches, interviews and such. We just had a, a talk uh, previously that mentioned storytelling, um, mm -hmm. but I often find myself lost on where to start. Do you have any pointers on beginning the storytelling process? I love this question. That's great because, so a pitch, is an example of a linear story, right? Like a movie, you have a, you have a deck of slides, just like I did <laughs> just now, and you're going to present them one after another, right? There's no choices. Um, and to make that interesting, you want to build in a sense of suspense, Right. So let's say you have um, three different logos that you want your your client or your teacher, or your students to evaluate and choose from. You don't want to show them all at once. <laughs> you want to deliver them in a sequence, but then show them all. Right. So that people can compare them and remember how they felt when they first saw that first one. Um, often in a pitch. You want to ask a question that's provocative. Um, and then over the course of your story, you reveal the answer. Um, so your question might be, um, we learned the one thing that's preventing um, people from accepting the COVID vaccine. And it's not what you think. Aren't you curious? Yeah. You want me to tell you what it is? Because I just read it? about it. <laughs> it's gut feelings. Ah. That is not that people don't have enough information. It's that they have a gut feeling about what they believe or don't believe. That's so true. And so as designers, if we wanted to solve that problem, we would have to really um, have empathy for people's gut feeling about that subject. And yeah. not just throw information at them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so building curiosity is really important. For sure. Uh, I wanted to ask in regard to your entire presentation on uh, storytelling, is there anything you think um, you shouldn't do when storytelling? Like what are, uh, what are the don'ts of storytelling, if any? Oh, gosh, that's a really good question, Jasmine. Well, like I showed the rule of threes. Um, which is really about editing. So you, so let's go back to pitching three logos. Don't pitch nine. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because oh, people nice. can't hold that in their mind. It's very frustrating. It's, it's what psychologists call um, choice fatigue, decision fatigue. Mm -hmm. But let's say you have nine logos and you're just, you just need to show, <laughs> you need to show them all. So put them in three categories. 
okay, say like, these are the happy logos, these are the angry logos, <laughs> and these are the sleepy logos. <laughs> and so then at least you've given a framework for people to um, simplify those, um, all the data that you've just uh, given them. Mm -hmm. So you need to have empathy for your user, yeah. especially, you know, in a linear presentation, um, people can't hold in their mind nine things. You don't want them to fall asleep. No. no. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think, yeah, that's so true. And um, it's almost like hierarchy too, like implementing that, um, uh, that key part of hierarchy into your storytelling. Right. So think of the New York Times uh, website. If all those things were just on a grid, there's probably 50 articles, mm -hmm. right? And if they're all just in a square, like tiles, you know, like an Instagram, you know, like your Instagram page, which shows your history or whatever, that's overwhelming. But creating some structure to it, some subordination gives people a, a starting point. Yeah, for sure. Um, my next question is, uh, it dives a little bit deeper and uh, I want to transition into talking a little bit more about your new book, uh, Extra Bold. Um, how do you think designers can use storytelling to talk about important issues like um, feminism, anti-racism? Um, I think one way is to make it personal, um, to include uh, people as opposed to only numbers and abstractions. Um, and I think that's very interesting because we're actually in a, in a conversation right now about racism uh, being systemic mm -hmm. and not being about just what individual people believe. Like I believe I'm not a racist person and I'm kind and think everybody's equal. Um, but systemic racism says that doesn't matter. I still live in a, in a society that is built on inequity. Um, so on the one hand, we want to like recognize the, the system, but we also want to, to make sure to um, have empathy for individual experience. Uh, and so, so principles like microaggression, for example, is very much about individual experience and what one, what one might have perpetrated mm -hmm. and what one might um, have been on the receiving end of. And so having those things in mind, I think is really important. As designers, you know, the, the importance of um, representing diverse people and our personas and our choice of icons and the way we use color <laughs> is, is super important. Um, in telling those stories and in representing a diverse world. And of course, incorporating accessibility into your work as well. Yeah, definitely. And um, myself, uh, personally, I it's something that I've been learning over the, the last year and um, want to include more in my work. Um, some of my thesis work includes it. And I think um, I think if you're, you're passionate about these issues and um, know that there, you have the power within design to, to uh, communicate them and make a difference within it. I think it's important too. And are you using storytelling in your thesis? Yes, I try to. Can you tell us a little about <laughs> after, it? After this, um, I definitely will uh, implement more storytelling when I when I do my pitches on it. But um, yeah, um, with with my thesis, uh, it's essentially um, I, I made kind of a toolkit for uh, young designers, um, students who are interested in the creative industry. Uh, who don't really have the support by their parents or whoever in their life um, when they're interested in pursuing it. Um, it's something that a lot of BIPOC um, designers and students face, um, something that I've faced myself personally, and uh, it stemmed from that uh, personal experience. And um, the whole goal with it, it was to uh, alleviate that hardship that um, students like myself had, have faced and will face. Um, just giving them uh, resources and representation to support them um, because it's otherwise not seen in our field. Thank you for doing that work. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask another question regarding this issue. Um, so when doing work within design to advocate and educate others on anti-racism, for example, are there difficulties you face when uh, telling a story that holds such significance and sensitivity? 
Yeah, so when I when I first started working on this project, I was just doing it with myself and my best friend Jenny, and we're both white women. And um, it just quickly became like clear that that isn't adequate and mm -hmm. that you need to have voices of other people. <laughs> and you know, our first technique was to get advice from other people and to um, include interviews with women of color and non-binary people of color. Um, and then we realized that that wasn't enough, <laughs> that, that our contributors had to be co-authors and had to be actually equally in, empowered and part of the project and not just subjects. Mm -hmm. um, it was also really important to me as a scholar to um, always footnote and credit and quote from scholars of color and feminists of color so that I'm not acting like this is my field that I created. Um, that rather I'm a student of that field. I am uh, honoring the work of the people who have done, done this, um, created these theories and research and evidence. Um, so that's uh, been super important um, mm -hmm. process and learning process for me in, in starting a project that, oh, I'm gonna write another book about feminism. <laughs> And then going like, oh my gosh, but feminism itself is kind of an exclusionary mm -hmm. principle. And there's a whole history of white feminism excluding women of color. And so coming to terms with that and, and figuring out how to address it appropriately was a, a learning experience. Yeah, definitely. And thank you so much for your work on this. I think um, it's it's such a great um, stepping stone into talking about these issues more. And um, I, I had a conversation with somebody recently where um, I think uh, it was practice for our BIPOC panel happening tomorrow. And I was saying that uh, we have these resources and um, it's great that we have, um, sorry, more resources like your new book coming out and um, another book by uh, I think Kelly Walters, um, yes. black, uh, black, brown, Latin uh, design educators. Uh, resources like this are so great, but there's not enough of them yet, but it's such a great start um, to open the door to more resources and um, different types of resources too that, um, uh, that can come about. And ultimately to help create the resources. So like your thesis, <laughs> your <laughs> panel know. that you're doing tomorrow. Yeah. Um, we're, we discovered, you know, all these incredible designers who are helping to create the history of design from, you know, women's perspective, queer perspective, black mm -hmm. perspective, Middle Eastern perspective. And that it's just so exciting to see people um, doing that, that work and creating the resources so that when someone like me goes to teach graphic design history, those stories are available to yeah. tell as part of the history of design. Definitely. Um, my last question for, for you for myself, but we'll take audience questions afterwards, uh, is Extra Bold is something relatively new to the design industry, um, similar to what I just spoken about. Mm -hmm. um, you don't see a lot of books about uh, anti-racism, feminism, and inclusivity specific to our field. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any other plans or goals to bring more awareness to these issues within the work that you do, maybe through curation or um, through other books that you may be uh, planning to do in the future. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, this is the book just came out. <laughs> um, I Yeah, it's really interesting that you asked that because this is another book that you may be familiar with, mm -hmm. Thinking with Type. Yes. This is the second edition and it was published in um, 2010. And I'm working on the third edition. And I started working on this right after I finished Extra Bold. And I'm like, mm -hmm. looking at this book, there's one woman type designer in the entire book. There's zero reference to non-Latin alphabets and writing systems. <laughs> I was just like, you know, oh my God, I have to wake up this book. So I'm redoing the book and it's still a type book, 
about learning how to do typography and letting and line spacing and type classification. <laughs> but there's a way to do it that is more inclusive. Um, and so for me, creating Extra Bold was like, what can I learn to do better? What can, how can I teach in a more inclusive way? How can I make my books more inclusive? That this isn't just like a lesson to share with people. It's like you have to live it. Um, and I'm not an activist. I'm not going to protest and carry signs and stuff. You know, I'm just, I'm kind of a homebody. Um, but I feel that in my work as a teacher and writer and curator, it's my duty to try to um, apply these lessons in, in what I do, you know, and try to learn. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I totally respect you for that. And I think it's something that we all need to challenge ourselves with, like, look at the work that we've done previously. And also, mm -hmm. um, just keep in mind the work that we were going to do going forward is like, are we inclusive? Are we, um, have we done actions in our work? Or um, does our work show um, inclusivity in any way? And how can we fix that? How can we go forward and learn from our mistakes? So uh, it's great that you're doing that to, to work on uh, Thinking with Type, which is a great book that I've um, had since first year. My be <laughs> I <laughs> looking forward, I'm looking forward to the third edition. Um, so we have some, some time for audience questions. Okay, so Mary says, uh, such a wonderful talk. Thank you so much, Ellen. Do you have any advice on storytelling and editorial design when a, a lot of linear text content has to be included? I have this question as well for myself. Oh, yeah. Well, one of the things that I've learned as a writer is that nobody reads the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and like, so when I put my books together, I actually make it so that you could open the book anywhere and just read that spread and it would make sense. So I really avoid like um, referring back to things that you should have learned on a different page, you know, <laughs> that people flip through books, they read a little bit, they maybe look up something in the index, but the kind of books that I do are not designed to be read from beginning to end. And so if you think about editorial design, think about that reader who doesn't want to read the whole thing and maybe only wants to read a caption or only wants to look at the infographics. And you want to make sure that that infographic really conveys um, you know, an honest account of the d data and so forth, the story behind the graphics without someone having to read the whole article. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what we do in typography is actually helping people read less, <laughs> finding ways to, to enter and exit quickly and, and not feel like they have to, you know, swim through 40,000 words to, um, to get what they want from it. Yeah, for sure. And I think, um, yeah, that's something that uh, we have to keep in mind as, as designers. Like, we're not always going to, no one's going to read everything. And even if they wanted to, like, that's up to them. Yeah. You have to make it work if they do. Yeah. The whole point <laughs> no of dummy time. <laughs> but you have to assume that, um, that people won't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? Oh, okay, we do. Um, Rosa says, uh, thanks, Ellen. What's your favorite story of all time? <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> um, all time. Breaking Bad. <laughs> Maybe it's the genre that I like. I like, um, I really like stories that have many short parts instead of like just a movie. I like episodes <laughs> because I, I like the depth of character development. Yeah, I, yeah. I so I love the way Walter White gets more and more <laughs> evil. 
Okay, I think that's, uh, we're out of time now. Uh, but thank you so much, Ellen, for, for joining us and for sharing all of your insight on storytelling and answering all these questions and giving all of this advice. Um, just a reminder to uh, check out our graduate work at yes.schooldesign.ca and also to follow us on Instagram at sod underscore yes, where we uh, do a recap of all of the days of the show in case you miss any of it. Um, so yes, thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Jasmine. It was really fun to talk to you. You did great. Me too. <laughs> thank you so much. Good luck with your thesis. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>